evening, brothers and sisters. It's beautiful that this evening we can come together to close off our year together in the presence of the Lord, to thank him for his gifts and to ask him for his blessing. I invite you to rise and let us worship the Lord. We begin this service with a confession that our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's now sing a song of praise to our God. We're going to sing together from Psalm 90, the verses 1, 7, and 8. Let's now make a profession of our faith. Let's do so this evening with the words of the Apostles' Creed as it's been set to music in hymn one.
Let's now call upon the Lord in prayer and let's ask God for his blessing. Almighty God and Father in heaven, we come before your throne of grace this evening, Lord, and we do so with so much gratitude in our hearts. We come to the end of another year. And once again, Father, you've been incredibly good to us. We have so much to look back on and so much to be thankful for. Thank you, Lord, for the, for the blessing that you gave us, that, that we're not greatly affected by COVID this past year. When we read the news and when we, we hear what's happened in other jurisdictions and in other places in the world, the many, many people's lives have been profoundly affected by this. And then we have been spared for most of that. Lord, that's such a, a gift out of your hand. We can live normal life. and We don't face disease. And we don't face illness. And we receive that as a gift from you. We honor you for that. Thank you for the blessing that you've given us in our families, Lord. Thank you that we have a year of peace and safety where we get to serve you. We get to meet together as your church in order to call upon your name, to worship you, and to glorify you. And we never have any trouble because of that. We never come into to conflict with with others because of that. What a gift it is to live in this country with so much peace and freedom, and we honor you for that. Thank you, Father, also for the spiritual gifts that you give us in Christ. We're so rich in Christ. You give us peace with you. You give us faith in our hearts. You give us hope for the future. You give us love. Thank you for the contentment that you work within us, that we accept the circumstances of our lives, and that we're truly rich, knowing you and living with you. Thank you, Father, for revealing yourself to us. We have another year where we can hear the proclamation of the gospel. We can consider who you are. We see the beauty of your character and the richness of the gifts that you've given us. And our hearts are filled with joy and gratitude towards you. Father, thank you also for the blessings in our family, for faithful marriages, for families where there's a lot of love, where there are children who grow up to know and love you, where they mature in faith, where we receive so much joy from you. Thank you, Father, for, for the gift of a communion of the saints, that you put us into a community of people, that there's so much spiritual maturity among us, and that we experience this in, in a rich way. Many times when we face difficulties in life, then there's, there's others who, who know about that, and who love us, and who support us, and who carry us through that. Father, you're so faithful, and you're so kind in giving this gift to us, and we honor you for it. Thank you also for the for the work that could be, we, be, we could be busy with in, in sharing the hope of the gospel also in PNG. We're so grateful that this past year that you've allowed us to take responsibility for the work. Thank you that you protect the missionaries, Pastor Ryan and, and Pastor David and their wives and families, and also Brother Ben Vandekamp and his wife and their children. Lord, we're so grateful to you for the work that they can do, for the beautiful spirit that they have, for the faithfulness that you've given them, and for the blessing over what they've done. What another rich treasure out of your hand we acknowledge this as a gift from you. We thank you, Lord, that, that in all these things, that you show your goodness and your faithfulness, that you're true to your promises, and that you show how much you love us. And it's really humbling to receive this from you, Lord, because we don't deserve it. Because we're people who, who often sin against you. If we reflect on our past year, then there's so many things that we've said and done that have shown a disregard for you, and a disdain for, for what you value. We don't honor you always, Lord. We don't always value the things that you do. And we also sin against the people around us. There's so much selfishness and pride, so much greed and covetousness and anger and lust, so much deception and disobedience. And we're sorry about that. And we pray for your grace and forgiveness. We ask that for Jesus' sake that you would show us mercy. Father, thank you for this opportunity to meet together with you again this evening, that we finish our year in your presence. We wish to, to acknowledge all the good gifts that you've given us. We wish to humble ourselves before you. We wish to be encouraged by your word. And we pray then, Father, that as we open your word together, that it may be a blessing for us, that we can consider again the riches of your promises to us and the calling that you place upon us. Hear us, we pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, brothers and sisters, this evening I get to preach the gospel to you as we find that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the first 11 verses there. 
The theme of the chapter is the day of the Lord is coming, and there's a calling to be prepared for that. And the Lord, he also encourages us that he will bring his people into his kingdom. And in connection with that, I thought it's appropriate to also read a few verses from Matthew. In Matthew 24, this theme is also introduced. So we're going to read together Matthew 24, starting at verse 36. We're going to read through to the end of the chapter. In your guest Bible, you can find it on page 986. So Matthew 24, we're going to start reading at verse 36. Hear the word of God. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father, also, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days, before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and, be, and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be left in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake, and he would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, My master is delayed, and begins to beat his fellow servants, and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour when he does not know, and will cut him in pieces, and put him with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So far. Let's now sing together of the care of the Lord, his provisions for us, Psalm 121, the verses 1 through 4.
So the text for the sermon this evening is taken from the passage here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to look at the first 11 verses. You can find that on page 1174 of your guest Bible. So the context here in 1 Thessalonians 5 is that the Apostle Paul has just told the Thessalonians of the coming of the Lord. It seems that some of the people have been a bit nervous about the fact that their dead relatives are going to miss out on on the coming of Jesus Christ when he comes back on the clouds of heaven. And the last verses of chapter 4, he encourages them. He says they're not going to miss out because when Jesus Christ comes back, they're first going to rise. And it's only after they are caught up together with the Lord that we who are left behind will be taken up together with them and then we'll be with the Lord forever. And it's in that context that he continues with the words of chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 1. Now concerning the times and seasons, brothers, we have no need to have anything written up to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of the light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing so far. Then after the proclamation of God's word, we're going to sing together from hymn 44, the verses 1, 4, and 5. Dear brothers and sisters, congregation loved by the Lord Jesus Christ, if you look back at the past year, then God's brought us another year closer to his return. If you reflect on this year, then wouldn't you agree with me that in many ways the Lord has been very good to us? He's really blessed us in a lot of ways. Here at WA, just mentioned in prayer, we've had another year with, without any real impacts because of COVID-19. It's quite a unique thing. We have peace and security within our country. It's not a lot of distress. We don't have the army that needs to protect us from invasion or attack like some other places in the world. Think about it on a personal level. I mean, so many blessings in our families and in our congregation. We have children who've been born, quite a few children who've made profession of faith. We have stunning education for our kids. We've really been blessed in, in many of our families. It's been a real time of, of peace and of joy and of growth. it has been lots of work this past year. If you talk to the business employers and if you talk to the employees, then, then everybody's got a job and everybody's been blessed with work. So many memorable events in our families, so many beautiful things that the Lord has done for us. It's not to say that there's no struggles or difficulties. Some of us have lost loved ones. Some of us have had children who've left the church. Some of us have had to deal with with other difficulty, sins we've committed, sicknesses with physical limitations, with broken relationships, with other hardships. And so there are difficult things as well that we've had to contend with. But then if I could also ask you to think of the question in another way, If you just think about it from a spiritual perspective, how's the past year gone for you spiritually? Has it been a time of growth for you? Have you come to know the Lord better? Have you grown in love for him, in trust, in dependence? 
Has your conscience been more aligned with the Word of God now than what it was a year ago? Do you ever have any highlights this past year? If you look back at the highlights, can you say that some of the highlights of my year were times where I got to meet together with the people of God and I got to worship the Lord? Or maybe has it gone the other way? Instead of growing spiritually, has it happened to you that you have... You've gone backwards, maybe hardened in certain sins, maybe skimming in a relationship with God, not as convicted, not as, as honest, don't spend as much time with the Lord. Have you offended the Holy Spirit by your actions? Have you become callous in your heart towards God in any way? Now, the reason I ask you to reflect on this, the question spiritually is because here in our text, the Lord tells us that the day of the Lord is coming. There's a real calling here to be prepared for that day. And the question becomes, well, how do you become prepared? And Paul tells the Thessalonians, he says, what you need to do is he says, you need to be sober. You need to be alert. You need to keep awake. You need, pre- you need to prepare yourself for the event of the return of Jesus Christ. And he does so by God drawing a contrast between the people of God who do so and others who don't. He says, if you look around you, there's enough people who are not doing that. They're not getting prepared. They're not aware. They're not living in the awareness of the return of Jesus Christ. And since they're not thinking about that, since they're not getting ready for that, this day is going to come as a great surprise. And it's going to bring great destruction into their lives. Well, Paul says, you're the people of God. God doesn't want that for you. He's not going to do that for you. And so he wishes to stimulate and encourage the Thessalonians and also us today to be prepared for this great event. And so I preach God's word to you with this theme, the day of the Lord is coming. And we're going to see in the first place the calling of the day, and then secondly, the comfort of the day. So what's the calling? Well, the first thing that God does here in this passage is that he reminds his people that Jesus Christ is coming. It's really quite striking here. He does it in quite a, a beautiful way. I often actually, I ask this question of my catechism students at some point. I, I ask them the question, I say, when the day of the Lord comes, is it going to be a surprise or not? Is Christ going to come like a thief in the night or not? That's a bit of a trick question. Because there are passages, we just read together in Matthew 24, where Christ says, he is coming like a thief. But then you also have other passages, like the one we have before us tonight here, 1 Thessalonians 5, where Paul says something really beautiful. He says, they know very well that the day of the Lord is coming. And so for them, it doesn't have to be coming like a thief in the night. So he starts off in verse 1 there, and he tells tells them, he says, now concerning the times and seasons, brothers, we have no need to write anything No need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. You know it's coming. You're not like the rest of the people in the world. And so he starts off this passage with a a real great encouragement for the people of God. And then when he he talks here in verse 1 about times and seasons, you could translate it as, as ages and epochs. He's really saying... You don't need anyone to tell you what age of salvation history we're in. We're not in the time before the flood. We're not in the time where the Israelites are living in the promised land or when they're in the exile or when they're waiting for the coming of Jesus Christ. We're in the time that's called the last days. We're in the time after Jesus Christ has come the first time, he's ascended into heaven, he's poured out his Holy Spirit, and the only thing left that needs to happen in the history of salvation is that he needs to return on the clouds of heaven. And Paul says to the people, he says, you know that. You all know that this is what we're looking forward to. Well, he says for other people, it's very different. Verse 3, while people are saying there's peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. 
was most people in this world, they're not expecting the return of Jesus Christ. They're carrying on with sinful lives, thinking that nothing bad is ever going to happen to them. Peace and safety. Literally, peace and security. She'll be all right, mate. Nothing will happen. It's the kind of thing the Apostle Peter spoke about, 2 Peter 3. In the last days, he says, you're going to have these scoffers who mock. They're going to ask, where is this promise of his coming? Ever since our fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were since the beginning of creation. God's never going to judge us. He's never done anything like that. If you look back in history, he's never done anything. He said that he's coming. He said he's going to judge, but nothing like that ever happens. And Peter turns around and he tells these people, he says, man, you have amnesia. Now, God's already done it. It's quite striking. It's an event that no one today ever wants to acknowledge or speak about. It's the flood. Peter says, if you think back to the flood, God's acted in profound judgment against the sin of the people of this world. Now, this flood is, is an evidence all around us. When you study creation, then there's all sorts of things in creation that indicate that there was a massive flood that happened at one stage on this earth. Lots of geological evidence. Well, nobody wants to acknowledge that. You know, today we've come so far that there's no knowledge of God. There's no acknowledgement of God. Nobody thinks that God even exists. And so they're not even thinking that he's not going to come. They're just not even thinking about God at all. Well, these are the people for whom Peter says, all of a sudden that day is going to come. They think they're secure. They think nothing's going to happen to them. And out of the blue, Jesus Christ is going to return. Christ says, when he does return, says he, or sorry, the Apostle Paul here, he makes the, the comparison with a woman in labor. And he says, as certainly as a pregnant woman has labor pains and gives birth, so certainly is Christ going to return on this earth. And so even though they're not aware of it, it's certainly coming. And then if you think back to the, to the earlier passages of the Lord Jesus Christ, he really warned his people that you know, most people around us, they're going to be in that place. He says, you, my people, you need to be aware. You need to be on guard. You need to watch out. Because most people around you, they're not going to pay any attention. And Christ uses two examples. The first example is the flood, Matthew 24, 37. There he talked about in the days of Noah, people are marrying and being given in marriage. They're buying and selling. They're eating and drinking. Until the day when Noah enters the ark, they're unaware that the flood's coming on them. And in one day, they're swept away. Or in Luke 17, the Lord Jesus uses the example of Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In those days, these men were, they were proud. They were sexually immoral. They were abusive. They were godless. Well, God told Abraham. He says, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to wipe these people off the face of the earth because of their rebellion against me. Well, Lot tries to warn his sons-in-law. Those men, they don't believe him. They don't, they don't think it's going to happen. They thought he was joking. And they rejected his warnings. That's well, the world in which we live, brothers and sisters. People, they reject the message that Christians bring. They don't believe that God's going to act in judgment. But he is just. And he will act. And the day is coming. Christ will return. And at that time, there's going to be a far greater judgment than what happened in the days of Noah or Lot. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, the Apostle Paul tells us that they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Well, then what Paul says here, is he says it's not only people out there who are going to be surprised. He says it's also people among you. There are some in the church as well who are not ready. Christ first made that 
that comparison back in Matthew 24 in the passage we read together. You have this, this servant. He's put over his master's estate. The master's gone for a long time. The servant convinces himself that the master's just never coming back. And so he starts to, to eat and drink with the drunkards. He beats his fellow servants. What's well, a message the Lord Jesus Christ picks up on in the, the revelation that he gives to the Apostle John. Revelation to the Church of Sardis, Revelation chapter 3. So maybe if you want to open your Bible with me, we'll just read a couple of verses there. So the first verses of Revelation chapter 3. So Revelation 3 verse 1, page 1220. There it says, To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words who him, of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I come against you. Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not spoiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You have the reputation for being alive, but you are dead. And Christ says you have to wake up. You need to strengthen what remains. And he says, if you don't wake up, then I'm going to come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. It's possible as a church to look alive, but not to have a real relationship of faith and love with Jesus Christ. Not to really be alive. Not to be spiritually alive towards God. But when you hear that, then you kind of wonder to yourself, well, what does that mean? What does it look like? What is God calling us to here? And he spells it out. It's in verse 6 of our text. If you go back to verse 6 there, so then, let us not sleep as others do, let us keep awake and be sober, for those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live in him. So first he says, you need to keep awake and be sober. The word for keep awake means to be on watch. It means to be alert, to be alive. You need to be alert. God calls you to, to be full of life. And it's really striking in other contexts where he uses this word for be alert, then there's, there's one thing he associates with that. You see it happen over and over again. Mark 14, 38, he says to his disciples, watch and pray so that you may not come into temptation. Ephesians 6, 18, God says, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Or again in Colossians 4, verse 2, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. The way to watch, the way to keep alert is through prayer. You need to be alert and you need to keep on praying. At the end of the day, the Lord's saying here is he's saying, he's the one who needs to protect you and to keep you safe and to bring you into his eternal kingdom. And so one of the most foundational things that you need to do is you need to develop a life of prayer where you live in humble service before the Lord, where you depend upon him in faith, and where you receive his blessing in your life. Well, maybe if I can use that as a framework, brothers and sisters, if you look back at the past year, 
Has this past year been a time of growth in prayer for you? Can you say that you've been alert, watching out against temptation, and that you've really grown in a life of prayer before your Father in Heaven? Especially about those areas where you're being attacked in your faith? Has that been a matter that you regularly bring before your Father in prayer and that you, you ask Him for His protection, for His help, that you engage with Him to, to plead for the gift of the Holy Spirit who keeps you safe through to the end? You know, real life, do you know the spiritual dangers that you face? Do you regularly pray about those things? In verse 11, we're, we're also called in this chapter to, to encourage one another. Maybe if I can use that here in this context already, do you also pray for each other? Do you pray for your husband or wife, for your kids? Do you pray for your brothers and sisters in the church, for others who you know are struggling with certain spiritual attacks that they face, that God would hold on to them, that he keeps them safe to the end? Do you, do you pray that you may grow in spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you know Christ and that you know how rich you are in Christ, that you know everything that he's done for you? The only way to keep awake, the only way to resist this temptation is through an intimate life of prayer. And then the second calling of our text here is also that God says we are to be sober. You can also translate it as to be self-controlled. From Titus 2, we learn that having self-control means that you say no to ungodliness and to worldly passions. Or in 1 Peter 1, along with preparing our minds for actions, preparing our minds for action and being self-controlled, we're called to fully set our hope on the grace to be given us when Jesus Christ is revealed and no longer to conform to the evil desires that we once had. Or in 1 Peter 5, we're called to be self-controlled and alert, and we're also called to resist the devil standing firm in the faith. The call is to be alert, to be self-controlled, and to pray. And to be self-controlled, that means, at the end of the day, the Lord's saying to you, he's saying, you need to flee from ungodliness and worldly passions. You need to stand firm in the faith. You need to set your hope fully on the grace that is to be given you. These are profound spiritual disciplines, brothers and sisters. You need to know who Christ is and what he's done for you. You need to recognize how in your heart you're making compromises in the service of God. How you're allowing the idolatry of self to undermine your service of God. You need to pray about that. You need to to have control in yourself around that and say, I'm not going to participate in these things. I'm not going to give in to these worldly passions. I'm not going to go along with that. But I'm going to develop a life where I I live for my Lord, where I'm ready for his return. And really, there's a calling to spiritual warfare here. And Paul uses similar language here in our text in verse 8 to what he does in the last verse of, of Ephesians 6. He says, but since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. It is a spiritual battle that we're engaged in. The devil's a powerful, malignant, spiritual being. And he targets you. He wants to take you down. He wants to destroy your faith in God. He wants to lead you astray. And the Lord loves you, and he doesn't want that to happen. And he's given you means. He says, the means that you use are are the means of prayer, where you come to me and where you ask me for help. The means that you use are are a life of self-control, where you ask me for the gift of the Spirit, and the Spirit lives in you, and he enables you to have control over yourself, so you don't do the things that you used to do. The means are being alert, that you're awake, that you're sensitive to to the pressures, the spiritual pressures that you face. The means are that you have brothers and sisters who walk alongside a life with you, and who care for you, and who uphold you, and who carry you. 
Well, it's really easy for us to drift, brothers and sisters. We live in a time of, of such affluence, a time of such godlessness. For most people around us, you know, they, they don't know the Lord. They don't serve him. They don't have a living relationship of love with Jesus Christ. And it's easy for us to, to also fall into a love of self. Whatever is comfortable for me, whatever is easy for me, whatever I want. And that the service of God, it doesn't, you never intend to leave God's service. But the service of God, it's something that just kind of slips by the wayside as time goes on. You know the really dangerous thing? The really dangerous thing is the seductive thought of later. I know I need to change. I know there's things that are not right in my life. I know I shouldn't be doing this. And I intend to change. I'll just do it later. Later when I'm older. Or later when I'm more mature. Or later when I have my life together. That was the, the servant in Matthew 24. My master is delayed. He's not coming back. I got time. I can do whatever I want. Well, if you take that approach, then you drift, brothers and sisters. Then later never happens. Then later, one day Jesus Christ returns when you're not expecting him. Well, you know, if you think about this, then the danger is that we focus all the attention on ourselves, on who we are, what we have done, what we haven't done, what we need to do. I'm not ready. I need to work harder. I need to change these things. I need to be different. You know, at one level, there is a calling for us to take responsibility for ourselves. But underneath of that, in this passage, the Lord, he also has a real word of encouragement he wants to encourage us that at the end of the day, it's not your doing. It's not about you. But your salvation is the work of your Savior. And it's his work for you. In the first place, God comforts us. He tells us how we're different from the unbelievers. We know the time when we're living. The day of the Lord is not going to come to us like a thief in the night. Because we're aware that we are in the last days. And we are those people who are prepared for the coming of the Lord Jesus. That's what he says in verse 4. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of the light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. If you want to know your identity, your identity, brothers and sisters, is that you're believers in Jesus Christ. You're part of the people of God. You know the Lord. and You have a relationship with him. And as those who know him, then you're those who will be included in the glorious work that he does for his people. And that's something that he really encourages the Thessalonians with, and also us today, in the last verses of our text, in verses 9 to 10. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live in him. We might live with him. God hasn't destined you for wrath. If you want to know about what he's destined you for, Paul says, he's destined you for glory. He wants to bring you into his kingdom. He has destined you to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for you, so that whether you are asleep or awake, you might live through him. Christ is your Lord. Christ is your Savior. Christ is the one who has the power, and Christ is going to bring you through to the end. You know, if we focus the attention on ourselves, then oftentimes there's a world of trouble. There's so much weakness. There's so much sin. There's so many things that we've done wrong, and there's so many things that we need to change. And then sometimes it can be really disheartening. We struggle because we want to be different, and we don't want to offend the Lord, and we want to be ready, and we do love him. And yet still, we sometimes fall into those same old besetting sins. And they have so much power over us. And then the Lord comforts you and he says, well, at the end of the day, it's not about you. It's my work. 
God wishes you to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ. Christ has, has died, and he has obtained your salvation, and he is going to bring you into glory. And if you turn with me to the last verses of our chapter, you see that, that the Lord really encourages his people to remember that he's the one who does it for us. So 1 Thessalonians 5, page 1174 there. It's right near the end of the chapter there. Paul's just been going on for two chapters, chapter 4 and 5, telling us about how to be sanctified, how we need to grow in holiness before the Lord. And then 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, he ends off with these very encouraging words. He says in verse 23, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. He will do it. He will surely do it. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Christ comes down in the clouds of heaven, then all those people for whom he has died, all those people who believe in him, He washes them with his blood. He sanctifies them completely, and he brings them into the eternal kingdom. They will be blameless. We will be blameless on the day of the Lord. That's not our doing, but that's his gift. It's a good place to end off the year, brothers and sisters. The Lord is a God who loves you, and he wishes to bring you into glory. And he sent his son to accomplish that work for you. And he encourages you to be faithful to the end. And then he tells you he's going to work it out and he's going to make it happen. Well, to him be the glory. Let us praise and thank him. Amen. Let's sing of this return of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to do so with the words of hymn 67, the verses 1, or sorry. So no, 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 I'm getting ahead of myself. First, we're going to sing of the the work of God, hymn 44, verses 1, 4, and 5. Let's now call upon the Lord in thanksgiving and prayer. Mighty God, Father in heaven, 
thank you for the wonderful promise that Jesus Christ is going to return on his great day. Lord, we thank you that the time is coming where you're going to bring us into a new world, where we get to see you face to face, where we get to live with you for all time. It's the greatest gift in the world, Lord, that you make us new, you make us holy, so that when we come into your presence, that you're not scary, but that seeing you and being with you is, is the greatest thing that we could ever want. Lord, we thank you that in the meantime, you've already done this for us in Jesus Christ. You've revealed yourself to us through your Son by sending him into this world so that we can get to know you on a really intimate level without being terrified by you. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you also that you call us to prepare ourselves for the great day of Christ. We ask you, Lord, to help us with that. Work in our hearts with your Holy Spirit that we may be awake, that we may be alert, that we may be those people who have self-control, that we not give in to, to worldly passions, but rather that we renounce sin, that we seek our Lord Jesus Christ, that we pray to you that you would hold us fast to the end. Please give us spiritual wisdom to understand the way in which we are being attacked. Please grant, Lord, that we hold on to the promises that you've extended to us, that we hold on to your word, that we use the, the truth of the scriptures to defend us against spiritual attack. Please also help us, Lord, that we, that we may walk in righteousness and in your truth, that we may have faith in your promises, and that in this way that you would keep us safe from the devil's attacks. Lord, at the end of the day, there's also a lot of weakness in our spiritual walk. And we ask then that you would cover our weakness with the blood of your Son, that the righteousness of Jesus Christ would be applied to our account, that in this way that he may bring us into glory. What a great promise that at the end of the day, you don't expect us to work these things out in our own strength, but that Jesus Christ has done it for us. And so, Lord, we humble ourselves before you, and we thank you for the gift of a Savior. And we thank you that, that through your Holy Spirit, you're working out our sanctification. We ask, Father, that, that you would work a lot of love in our heart for you, that we love you dearly, and that we rely upon you to, to finish the work that you've begun in us. Father, we pray that our Lord Jesus Christ may return quickly. We live in a world where there is profound godlessness, and that has quite a serious impact in our lives. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to, to be so grounded in your word that we may continue in faith before you. Please also assist our children that they don't get sucked into this world where there's no knowledge of you, but that they may remain steadfast and firm in knowing you and in walking in your ways. Father, we pray that you would please also bring back to you those those among us who have wandered away from you. Again, this past year, we have some members of our church who have left us for different reasons and at, at different times. They've rejected the faith and they've gone in a different direction. And Lord, that causes us profound grief in our heart. We bring that before you and we ask that you would please bring them back to us, that you work repentance, that you allow them to, to once again be included among your people. Father, we also pray that you would Please also help those who are struggling in faith. We have members of our congregation who, who really have serious doubts and serious struggles in their faith in you. We pray that you put a hedge around them, that you protect them. You also ask, we also ask that you help us to, to love them and care for them, that we may speak the truth to them, that we can show the love of Jesus Christ for them, that in this way that you would once again strengthen them in their faith in you. Father, we also pray that you would comfort those who, who also are grieving because of loved ones who have gone astray. We speak with the parents, with the grandparents in our midst, who, who grieve their children and grandchildren. And we also pray, Father, that you would help us with all the other difficulties of our lives. There's so much brokenness we have to contend with. We have broken relationships. Sometimes we, we have to struggle with profound sin in our own lives. We also have to, to grieve the loss of loved ones. We face death and we lose communion with those whom we love. And Father, it's usually in those times that, that we can be attacked as well. That's when we are vulnerable. We pray that you hold on to us, and that you protect us, and that you keep us safe. Please grant that as, as a community, Lord, that you, that you bless the work of the office bearers, 
so that we may faithfully bring your word to your people and encourage them. And bless us as a congregation, that you bless our conversations together, that we can encourage each other and love each other and build each other up. Thank you, Lord, insofar as that happens, and we pray that that may continue more and more. Father, we, we eagerly look forward to the day when Jesus Christ returns in the clouds of heaven. And we ask that you also bring in all those people who are your children who do not yet know you. Grant that within our city, within our communities, that you would please bring your people to us. Grant that we can use the opportunity to love them and care for them, that we can disciple them, that they too can share the hope of the gospel. Father, please grant us our requests and hear us, not because we deserve these things, but for the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this evening you have the opportunity to give your thank offerings to the Lord. The collection tonight is going to be for the Ministry of Mercy. We're going to have a special collection for the work of Eucalypt, for the uh, members of our church who have special needs and and need help in special ways. And I I thought to encourage you in that, that I'd read a few verses with you from Deuteronomy chapter 14. Deuteronomy 14, the Lord teaches his people to give a tithe, that's to give 10% of, of what they had, and to bring that to the Lord. And then it's it's really interesting, after commanding them, is a number of specific um, commands about bringing the tithe. If they can't bring it all the way to Jerusalem, they're able to sell the animals and then bring the money and then give that to the Levites. And then at the end of it all, in verse 26, it says, And you shall eat there before the Lord your God and rejoice, you and your household. And so when you give the tithe, the Lord says, one of the things I'd like you to do is to have great joy in doing that. That you rejoice before the Lord your God and the gifts that he's given you, and that you celebrate those gifts also in giving them to those who have need. So may that also be encouragement for us, that we joyfully give for those who need special help in Eucalypt. You're going to have the opportunity to do that at the doors at the end of this service. Then in closing, I invite you to rise, and we're going to sing together from hymn 67, the verses 1, 3, 6, and 7.
receive now the blessing of God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.